I've already mentioned to you this week that I, that I enjoy fishing. And I really do going out, and I love to fish for largemouth bass. I love to fish for, for catfish. And um, my parents, uh, when we moved from Georgia, I was born in Stockbridge, we moved to North Carolina, and my parents sold a construction business and then moved to North Carolina, and uh, we, they bought a campground, and we owned and operated a campground uh, during my high school years. And on the campground, there was two lakes. There was a, there was a larger lake, and then there was a, a back lake. And uh, we had these signs all around the back pond that was catch and release only. Because we didn't want people all catching all the fish. And we wanted kids that came to be able to fish and be able to catch brim and for it not to get fished out because people were eating everything. And so the front lake was for catching and keeping them. And the back lake, back lake was for catch and release. And I, I don't know about you, whenever you go fishing, if you're a catch and release kind of a person or maybe you're a catch them and grill them and keep them kind of a person. I, I'm not exactly sure. I was, I was always kind of the catch and release kind of guy. I just wanted to, you know, hook the fish and torture it for a little while and get it in and show it and take a picture of it and then let it swim off, you know, to, to be able to go and live another day. I mentioned this story because I just want you to think here for a moment. The Bible says in Matthew, and I'm going to go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 17 if you would like. Um, the Bible says in Matthew chapter number 4 and verse number 19, Jesus says to his disciples, he says there, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, I have a question for you tonight. Do you think when Jesus was talking about being fishers of men, that he was talking about being fishers of men in the catch and release sense? Or do you think that he was talking about being fishers of men in the catch it and keep them type of sense? Catch them and keep them, right? And so that's the title of the message tonight. Catch them and keep them. Catch them and keep them. In Acts chapter number 17, where you are, we find where Paul first goes to the city of Thessalonica. And you'll see why we're reading through this here in just a moment. But look at it there in Acts chapter 17 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Now when they had passed through, they being Paul and those traveling with him on his missionary journeys, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And what I want us to do here is spend a few minutes looking at the background of uh, Thessalonica, of the of First Thessalonians, where we're going to eventually get to and be able to spend and find our text that we really want to be able to look at and dig into here tonight. But it's important that we understand the backstory of the book of First Thessalonians. So we need to look at uh, this story here in Acts chapter 17 so we know what happened when Paul first went to the city and eventually he would write back to the city, the church that was there, he would write to them the book of First Thessalonians. So I want you to see the background here of this book. So let's pick it up here in verse number 2. The Bible says, so he came uh, to Thessalonica, and it says, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. So he would go into the synagogue, and he would open up the Bible, and he would literally reason with people out of what it is that the scriptures were telling them and how Jesus Christ was fulfilling all of the prophecies from the Old Testament. And he's trying to help these people understand that Jesus is the promised Messiah from the Old Testament. Now, anytime the gospel is preached, the good news of salvation, which is what he's preaching here to the, church, to the people there in Thessalonica, anytime that the gospel is preached, two things happen. You're going to see the first thing that happens in verse number four, and then we'll see the second thing that happens in verse number five. So let's look at verse number four and see the first thing that has happened any time that the gospel is preached. The Bible says in verse number four, and some of them did what? Believed. You know, that's an encouraging thing. That ought to encourage all of us as we go out and we try to take the gospel to those that we know and those that we don't know. Whenever you preach the gospel, some people are going to believe it. And that is a real encouragement for us. It says, some of them believed and consorted or joined with Paul and Silas 
And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. So what's happening here is that a church is being founded in Thessalonica. People are believing the gospel, and there are baby Christians now that are in this city. There are people who are, have just accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now, let's look at the second thing that happens anytime the gospel is preached. Verse number five. But the Jews which believed, what's the next word? Not. So some people are going to believe, and some people are not going to believe. And listen, that's the way it was in Paul's day. That's the way it was when Jesus was preaching. That's the way it was when the prophets were preaching. That's the way it is when we preach now. That's just the way that it always has been, and that's the way that it always will be. So you should understand, whenever you're preaching truth from God's Word, there's going to be some people that agree, and then there's going to be some people that don't. But sometimes the people that don't, they get a little riled up, and that's what happened here in Thessalonica. So let's just continue reading. In verse number 5, it says, the Jews which believed not, moved with en- envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. Don't you just love King James English? Cert- you couldn't have said that any better, right? They gathered together certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and they gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. So there was, there was a mob scene that had developed here in Thessalonica because Paul had just simply came through and was preaching the simplicity that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died on the cross for their sins. And if they put their faith and trust in him, that he would give them an eternal home in heaven. So that's just a simple message that he was preaching. And there were some people that didn't like it. And there was literally a mob scene. And they had pulled people out of their house and they were going to uh, do bad things to them. And uh, so we see all of that taking place here. So this is a... This is a This is not a good situation, is what I I want you to understand. And so in verse number 10, it says, The brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming hither went into the synagogue of the Jews. So a question for you. About how long then was Paul in Thessalonica with these people who had just believed the gospel? He was with them about three weeks because back in verse number uh, two, it says, as his manner was, he went unto them and three Sabbath days he had reasoned without them the scripture. So that's about three weeks that is there. And then he's the, the mob scene happens and he's run out of town. All right, so let's continue to read and see what happens. He's run out of town. And in verse number 10, he goes uh, to the next city, which is called Berea. In uh, verse number 7, it says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. And therefore, many of them believed, also of the honorable women, which were Greeks of a, and of men, uh, not a few. There's so much that could be said about these verses, but we don't have time here this evening. Verse number 13, it says, But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also. And they stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they had conducted Paul and brought him to Athens. So what happens here? Paul goes into this place and uh, he preaches the gospel. And some people believe the message that he is preaching. And so there's some young converts that are there. And uh, they, they've only been around Bible preaching, good, solid Bible preaching and learning about Jesus for a very short amount of time. Some of them maybe got saved the first Sabbath day. Some of them maybe got saved the second or the third Sabbath days. But any way that you slice it, uh, these people were new believers. And the person that led them to Christ had been run out of town because of a mob scene. And I just want to tell you that Paul had a really hard time with this. Paul was burdened about those people there in Thessalonica that he had left behind. And I want you to go now to the book of 1 Thessalonians, and I want us to just see how uh, Thessalonians is laid out here. All this by way of background to get us to where we really want to be uh, this evening. So go to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. And really what you find here when you get to uh, Thessalonians, I like to call uh, Thessalonians Christianity 101. 
Because Paul is writing back to these believers that he was only able to spend three weeks with. And uh, so he writes them this letter. And uh, if you were going to write a letter to people that had just recently been saved, you'd want them to know certain things. And, and really, that's what you find here in the book of First Thessalonians. But the first three chapters of the book, he literally is just rehearsing uh, what took place uh, there in Acts chapter 17 that we just read about. And so you see a lot of Paul's heart that comes out here in these first chapters. So just look at this a little bit at chapter one, verse number two, uh, Paul says, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, so on and so forth. And he talks about how uh, they believed the gospel there in verse number five and in verse number six, how the believers became followers of them. And he begins to just go on and on. And down in chapter two, in verse number one, he says, for yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain. And verse number two, but even after we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel with much contention. What contention is he talking about? I think he's talking about the mob scene that was there in Acts chapter 17 that we just read about. So Paul is just rehearsing over and over again in these first couple of chapters of the things that had happened. And he remembers how they uh, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he remembers uh, the contention that was there. And he's just rehearsing all that they had gone through together before he was literally run out of town. And now I want you to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and look in verse number 1. And so Paul gets run out of town, and uh, he's eventually, he ends up all the way down in Athens. And by the time he gets to Athens, he just can't take it anymore. He wants to know how these young converts are doing. And so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 1, he says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, when we could just Take when we just couldn't take it anymore, he says. We thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and we sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Verse 5 again, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. So he just can't take it anymore, and he sends Timothy back to the city of Thessalonica so he can check on them to see how they're doing. And then once he gets a report of how they're doing, he wants them to come back and be able to share that with him. So in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse number 6, it says, When Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have remembrance of all, all of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. And it goes on and on and on. Okay, I've said an awful lot of stuff. Let's summarize. Paul goes to Thessalonica. He begins to preach the gospel. There's a group of people that believe. The people that don't believe gather up a mob scene. They run Paul out of town. Paul only gets to spend three weeks with them. Paul's heart is attached to these individuals that he's led to Christ. And he wants to be able to be more of a help to them, but he's unable to because he gets run out of town. Finally, he can't take it anymore. And he sends one of his preacher boys, Timothy, back to Thessalonica to get a report to see how everybody's doing. And when Timothy gets there, he finds that they're all doing well. There in Thessalonica, Amongst the contention, amongst the mob scene, if there's ever been a time you would think that maybe the believers wouldn't have stuck, it would have been right here. But when Timothy goes back, he finds that they're still there. Why am I saying all this? I'm saying because when Paul fished for the souls of men, he kept them. And I think that's amazing. I get the privilege as an evangelist to travel across the country. And I just want to tell you that it is the same story that you hear no matter where you're at in the country. You talk to some people at the church and the story will go something like this. Well, we've seen a number of people get saved, but we don't know where they're at. Now, I want to say that part of that is just the time in the day in which we live. The sense that we are living in a culture that is biblically illiterate and they don't understand the need to be able to come to church. So I'm not going to place all the blame squarely on us, all right? I just want us to be able to say, hey, look, is there something that we need to be doing differently so that we can keep the people that we reach? 
Paul was able to do that. He was able to keep the people that he reached. So what I want us to do here for the rest of the evening is to look just at a couple of verses and see how it was that Paul did ministry. How did he do ministry? Because however he did ministry, he was successful in keeping the converts that he made. All right, so 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, we're finally going to get to our text here tonight. The Bible says in verse number 10, and this is Paul. He's writing here to the believers at Thessalonica, and he says to those believers, he says, Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe, as ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Let's go to the Lord and ask his help here on our few minutes together. Father, I thank you for the time that you've given to us to spend here this evening. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to see how it was that Paul did ministry here. Help us to really open up uh, Paul's heart and help us to see, uh, Lord, his love for people. And then, Lord, help us to realize that we need to have the same love for people that Paul had. And the Lord, help us to figure out how it is that we can do that effectively. Father, I love you. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. The first thing comes from verse number 10 tonight. The Bible says, There ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believed. Point number one, if you want to have uh, the ability to catch and keep, if you want to keep those converts that you make, um, you need to be who you ought to be. Very simply put, you need to be who you you ought to be. There it says that Paul behaved himself, he behaved himself holily and justly and unblameably. His life was characterized by holiness. His life was beyond reproach. He didn't preach a message and say, well, listen, do as I do, do as I say, not as I do. His life complemented his message. Paul demonstrated what it meant to be a Christian. Can I tell you something? The message of the gospel and the message of the scriptures is extremely powerful whenever it is preached and heard. But it is infinitely more powerful when it is preached from a man who is living it and demonstrating to you what it is to be a Christian. I am so very thankful for the pastor that I have at my home church in Crossroads Baptist Church in Columbus, North Carolina. His name is Nathan Dietrich. And can I tell you, I want to hear what he has to say to me because he lives it. And there isn't anything that he is doing from that pulpit that is a fake. He is as legitimate and as a sincere of a Christian that I have ever met in my entire life. And because of that, I literally sit on the edge of my seat so I can hear what it is that he has to say to me. We need our lives to complement the message of the gospel that we are sharing. Does your life oppose your message? Do you preach holiness and practice unholy behavior? Do you preach for others to be blameless while you yourself are entangled in sin? My home in South Carolina, I'm thankful I just got a a text from our pest control guy who's going to come and he's going to spray our yard for mosquitoes tomorrow. And uh, I am fairly convinced that every mosquito that uh, lives in the state of Florida is bred and develops in my backyard. And I don't know why that is, but I... I hate mosquitoes, but they, they, they are just, oh, you can just think about going outside and you can get bit by a mosquito at my house there in Bowling Springs. And so whenever I go outside, I, I, I will take bug spray and I will put that on and so I can go outside and so I can keep the mosquitoes away from me, right? And so I put on bug repellent because I don't want these mosquitoes. We have to be careful as Christians if our life is opposing the message that we are preaching. We are literally putting on soul repellent. And the things that we are trying to get people to understand, all we're really doing is running them away from the message that we so desperately want them to hear. Because I don't know about you, but people can spot hypocrisy. And hypocrisy 
just is going to run people off. And Paul didn't have that problem. Paul was the real deal. Can I ask you tonight, are you the real deal? Are you real? Man, you ought to be. If you start soul winning, and you start seeing people saved, and you start trying to disciple people, make sure that your life complements the message that you want people to be able to understand and implement into their own lives. My neighbor uh, has a son, and uh, he's probably, uh, I don't remember how old he was when he was trying to learn to mow the grass, maybe uh, 12 years old or something like that. They had a, they had a riding lawnmower, and uh, he, he was out there, and he's teaching him all the, all the different things that he had to do to be able to mow. And uh, he gets on the, on the lawnmower, and his dad steps back, and he's going to be able to take across the yard and, and do all the things. So he, so he gets it fired up, and man, I'm telling you, he's excited, and he gets to go, and man, he heads across that yard, and there's a flurry of commotion, and there's a flurry of activity. But the grass isn't getting cut because he forgot to engage the PTO, right? So he didn't have any blades that were turning. You and I can be like that as Christians when our life opposes our message. There can be a flurry of activity. There can be all kinds of things that we're trying to do to be able to reach people. But at the end of the day, we're just not cutting any grass and we're not making any real progress because our lifestyle is opposing the message that God wants us to be able to share. Just simply put, Paul lived like a Christian. His life was characterized by holiness, and he lived beyond reproach. And if we want to be effective at keeping those that we catch, we need to be able to do the same. We need to be who we ought to be. Second thing I want you to see from this is in verse number 11. We need to not only be who we ought to be, but we need to be in the right spirit. We need to do ministry in the right spirit. Verse number 11 says this. Paul says to these believers, he says, ye know how. Do you see that word? I have that word circled in my Bible because the how that you do things is really important. He says here, ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Let's suppose for a moment that I wanted to get my wife a dozen roses. Now, after she fainted, because that would be a little out of the ordinary, I'm sad to say, all right? But let's suppose that I I, I went and I bought my wife a dozen roses, and then I came into the house and I slammed the vase down and I slid it across the counter and I said, here, I got you some roses. And I walked off. How would, it, how would that go, ladies? It wouldn't go so well. What I'm trying to say is the how that we do ministry is really important. It's really important. There's a few things here in this verse I want us to consider about how we need to be with new converts. How are we to minister to them? At the end of verse number 11, the Bible uses this phrase. It says, as a father doth his children. Now, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 4, you probably know, but it talks about fathers bringing up their children in the nurture and admonition of of the Lord. Well, if a father is going to bring up his children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, how do you think that you as a Christian need to disciple those people who you lead to the Lord? Can I say that you ought to be in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? You know, one of the things where parents can go wrong is when they just make everything about commands. You need to do this. You need to do that. And they give them all kinds of commands and they give them all kinds of instruction and they do the, all of that apart from a relationship. And I'm telling you, parents get off base whenever they do that. And we need to be the same way with people that we lead to the Lord. It can't just be do this, do that. Here's a command. You've got to get this right in your life. You've got to stop doing this. You need to start doing this. And if you're not, you're not living right. That's, that's not the right how. There's got to be some nurture. There's got to be love. There's got to be relationship. There's got to be something more than just the rules. Yes, they need to see doctrine on display in your life. They need to see that you are living those rules. But maybe, maybe you're working with somebody and you see that there's a, there's a physical need that they have in their life that, that, that you can meet. Maybe you need to do that. 
Maybe you need to just find a way to love them. Maybe you need to find a way to spend some time with people outside of church. The only time the person that you're discipling, if the only time that they see you is in these four walls, we're doing discipleship wrong. Take them out to eat. Have them over to your home. Play games with them. Show them what it's like to be a Christian outside of these four walls. You know, it takes time to raise kids, doesn't it? Some of you have had more experience than, uh, than I do at this, but I'm in the middle of it. You've seen my children here. They're 14 and 16. And, you know, I think there's still some work yet to be done. Uh, we've done a lot of work. But uh, in general, you know, people think that it takes about 18 years to raise children, don't they? Well, if the Bible uses the term here in relation to Paul and his new converts, how, how long do you think that we should be willing to invest in somebody to disciple them? Maybe a lot longer than just a 13-week curriculum or, or whatever it may be that, that we're thinking about doing with them for, for discipleship. We must be patient. We must be patient and we must love them. If we're harsh, if we're unloving, if we're unkind, if we're overly demanding and uncaring, we're not going to keep those that we catch. The Bible says there in verse number 11, that uh, says, as, as, as you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged. And then the next phrase is every one of you. How? We need to be willing to minister to every single person. Any person that walks through the doors of your church, you ought to love. And you ought to be literally fighting over each other to be able to welcome visitors here. And uh, they literally ought to be just overwhelmed by uh, the people who want to be able to introduce themselves and to be able to love on them. I, I don't, I don't, um, I was talking to my wife about this a little bit earlier. I, I'm not preaching this message here tonight because I've seen things here that I'm trying to correct. I, I'm preaching this because I've seen it in an awful lot of places. Right, and and I don't think it's here, but I, I just want to share with you an illustration of something that I that I saw I got to experience. I, I went to a church, and I'm not going to tell you where it was, and uh, it was a Sunday morning a service, and I preached. Now, whenever I go to church, I don't know who's a visitor. I don't know who the deacons are. Uh, sometimes I don't even know who the pastor's kids are because I just got there, and I, I literally I don't know anybody. And uh, so I'm there at this church, and, and I preached a Sunday morning service, and then they were having a, a, a meal afterwards, a potluck lunch. I like potluck lunches. I bet you do too, right? And uh, so anyway, uh, I was one of the last ones to be able to make it into uh, the room there uh, for the luncheon, and people had kind of gone through the lines. And when I walked in the door, there was this couple that was standing uh, kind of on the wall of the lunchroom. And uh, so I noticed that they were there. But as soon as I got into the door, uh, people said, hey, uh, Brother Duke, so glad that you're here. Please, you and your family, go ahead and get yourself in line and uh, work your way through. So we did. We, we got our food, worked our way through the line, came around, and we didn't really know where to sit. So I just went up a place where there was nobody there, and I sat down there. And then I noticed that this couple was still standing up there on the wall. And I thought, well, that's just awkward, you know. And I, again, I never know what's going on in churches. And sometimes there's just some interesting things that go on. And I try not to make much about them because I don't really know. Well, eventually this couple came and they got their food. And uh, they, when they were done, they came over and sat down next to us. And we began talking to them. And folks, I kid you not, they were first-time visitors to the church. Nobody, nobody asked them to go through the line. Nobody invited them to sit with them at their table. I was heartbroken. I bet it was the only time that they ever went to that church. And I'll tell you something else. It's the only time I ever went to that church. There's just a way to do things that we need to make sure that we're doing. And it's called love. It's just love. And you minister to everybody, every single one of them. You love them. You love them. You care for them. You cherish them. Uh, you see a lot of Paul's heart here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse number 7. The Bible says this. We were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. 
That's a really good theme verse for discipleship right there. Be like a nurse who's cherishing a child and just loving on them. That's what discipleship needs to be. That's how Paul did ministry, and that's why he was able to keep those that he won. Look in verse number 8. The Bible says, So being affectionately desirous of you. Isn't that amazing? That's the way we ought to be. You know, a visitor comes here to this church, you know what you ought to be. Every single one of you ought to be affectionately desirous of that person. You lead somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ out there and as a soul winner, and, and you see somebody trusts Christ as their Savior, you ought to be affectionately desirous of them. He says, we were willing uh, to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls because you were dear unto us. Are you trying to get, are you getting a little bit of the glimpse of the magnitude of discipleship and the responsibility that is there as a Christian to love on people whenever they do trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their savior? You're not willing to just give them the gospel. Friends, you're willing to give them your life. You have to pour everything that you know into that individual. That's why people loved Paul, because Paul loved them. First Thessalonians chapter 3, we've already looked at this a little bit. Again, I'm just trying to show you Paul's heartbeat here. In First Thessalonians chapter 3, he, he had led these people to the Lord, and then he didn't see them for a little while, and so he's, he, he's just agonizing in his heart about where they are. And what's happening with them? So chapter 3, verse number 1, he says, Wherefore, when we could just no longer forbear, we thought it to be good to left at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother, to go and check on you. And then again, down to verse number 5, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear. Listen, if you lead somebody to the Lord and as a soul winner, and maybe you lead them to the Lord out there, maybe you invite them to church and they get saved or whatever it may be, and then the next Sunday rolls around and they're not there, and the next Sunday rolls around and they're not there, this ought to be your heartbeat right here. You ought to not be able to take it. I mean, it ought to just be eating you alive that they're not here. Where are they? What's going on with them? I'm concerned about these individuals. This is what Paul would do. And, and his heart was breaking, literally, because he didn't know what was happening with his converts. I am, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it here. I think one of the greatest uh, misunderstandings about soul winning is the sense that we find somebody, we share the gospel with them, we lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and then we dust our hands with them and say, well, wish you luck, and then we go and we try to find somebody else to lead to the Lord. Listen, friends, I'm all for going and finding somebody else to lead to the Lord, but don't forget about the people that you have led to the Lord. Those people are babes in Christ, and they need your help, and, and they need to be discipled, and they need to be brought along in the Christian faith. And if we don't love them and we don't, we don't love them to church, then the likelihood is they're not, they're not going to come. And we won't be able to retain the people that we reach. And, and I want to be the first one to admit to you, listen, I know that this is difficult. And I'm you can't force feed somebody that doesn't want to be fed. And not everybody is going to want to come. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to live in a fairy dream world here. I'm just simply trying to say, do everything that you can. That's what Paul would do. Paul would do everything that he can. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number 11, the third thing here I want you to see what Paul did is Paul stood for truth. Paul stood for truth. Maybe uh, some of this has just seemed kind of soft up to this point, and we're supposed to be, you know, like a nurse, and we're supposed to be just cherishing these people, and we're supposed to be just loving them, and we're supposed to just be bending over backwards for them. But Paul stood for truth, and we see that there in verse number 11 as well. It says, as you know how we exhorted, and we comforted, and we charged. Now, those are good words right there. Uh, we are to exhort new believers. We are to charge new believers with how to live right. And we don't need to be backing down from standing for truth 
to be able to minister to somebody. In other words, we don't need to be pushovers. As parents, we're not pushovers, right? And we don't need to be pushovers with people who have just trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as uh, their Savior. But let me say to this, minister to them like the Holy Spirit ministers to you. Does the Holy Spirit ever back down from truth with you? Has he ever told you that it was okay to just dabble a little bit in that sin over there? He never has, has he? He's pretty firm, isn't he? But you know, he's so patient and he's so loving and he forgives and he's willing to just keep on ministering to you even though really uh, he shouldn't. Does that make sense? That's the same sort of attitude that we need to have with people who we are trying to bring along and nurture along in the Christian faith. Think just for a moment about what a drastic change it would be to get saved later in life and maybe not have any kind of a background about Christianity and the Bible. There would be an awful lot of things that you don't know. And it's going to take time to be able to get a framework of the scriptures, to be able to understand all those things. Could you imagine not going to Sunday school growing up and not, not hearing about all of those Bible stories and, and hearing the pastor say, turn to such and such book and not know where it's at and all of these things. We have to understand something about the people that we are ministering to. One of the things that I think that uh, is fascinating and, and I'm thankful for it, is, is uh, well, in fact, uh, what was your name? Miss, uh, all right, I can't hear. What is it, Pastor? Yeah. Miss Stephan. Stephan? All right, Miss Stephan was talking about uh, just a little bit to me before the service, and I hope you don't mind me saying these things, but basically they had moved to the area, and they were looking for a church with the right doctrine and the right philosophy of ministry, and they ended up here. I think that's a wonderful thing, and I'm so glad that you did. And I'm so glad that this church has the right doctrine and has the right philosophy of ministry. And that's a real encouragement, and that's a real blessing. But, you know, she came to this church because you had the right doctrine. She came to this church because you had the right philosophy of ministry. Can I tell you why a new convert is not going to come to your church? Because you have the right doctrine and because you have the right philosophy of ministry. That ain't why they're coming. They don't even know what that is. Most people that join, in my experience as I, that I see, most people that move to an area and join an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, Baptist church are looking for doctrine and looking for philosophy of ministry. And that's just not why your convert's going to come here. Why is your convert going to come here? Your convert's going to come here because... They know that somebody genuinely loves them. They're going to come here because they see that your life also supports the message that you're sharing with them. They're going to come here because they're being ministered to in the right spirit. And they're going to come here because you stand in opposition to a sinful lifestyle that they're living and that they actually know that you want the best for them. That's why they'll come. But they're not going to come because we're right. That's why a lot of people come, but that's not why a new convert's going to come. And we need to understand that. Being right's not an attraction for people who are just newly saved. Verse number 12, something else we need to keep in mind here is to be conscious of the goal. The goal is so much more in soul winning. The goal is so much more than seeing someone accept Christ as their Savior. In verse number 12, Paul's goal for them is that they would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Our goal should always be to get beyond the gospel into Christian living. Listen, I've spent a great deal of time here this week talking about soul winning and trying to reach people with the gospel and making converts and seeing people trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. But let me shock you here. I don't see in the Bible that we're ever commanded to go out and make converts. I see that we're commanded to make disciples. We're commanded to teach. And that's a whole lot more. And it involves a whole lot more than the simple truths of salvation. So we need to keep the big picture in mind as a soul winner 
that it involves discipleship and a lifelong of pouring our hearts and lives into that individual as well. Really, their salvation is where the hard work begins. And it's a lifelong process. Lastly, I would just say this. As we minister, as we are soul winners, as we are discipling, let's be aware that people are observing us. Would you notice it in verse number 10? The Bible says, this is here again, Paul, he's talking to the Thessalonian believers. He says, ye are witnesses and God also how we behaved ourselves. Can I just tell you that however you do ministry, people are watching how you do ministry. But even more importantly than people watching how you do ministry, God is watching how you do ministry. And I don't know about you, but boy, that's a great weight upon my shoulders. And I want God to be pleased with the way that I do ministry. And if I'm going to be trying to pour my life into somebody, I want, I want God to be pleased with what I'm doing. And I don't, I don't want to be pushing that person away. I want to be drawing that person in to the love of the Savior. It's a simple message here tonight. Uh, just a message on how to do ministry. And soul winning is important, folks, but it's just the beginning of our involvement with an individual. There's so much more at stake than just the gospel of salvation and how a person can trust Christ as their Savior. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, I thank you so much for the time that you've given to us here this evening uh, to just look into your word Father, for us to learn something about the Apostle Paul tonight and for us to really be able to have a glimpse into his heart and to see how it is, Lord, that he was such an effective minister to these people. And Father, I pray that you would help us to think these things through and, Lord, make sure that we're doing ministry in a way that you would be honored and pleased with. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to ask you a couple of questions here this evening. And I, I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand. But can I just ask you, are you the kind of person that you ought to be? Is God pleased when he looks at your Christian life? And if you start working with a new believer, is your life going to complement your message? Or is your life going to oppose your message? Do you have the right spirit of patience and love when you're dealing with either the lost or perhaps a newly saved individual? Do you stand for truth? Or are you a little bit wishy-washy and a little bit too permissive whenever it comes to people's sins? Do you realize when we're talking about soul winning, that we're talking about much, much more than seeing somebody trust Christ as their Savior. You realize that this includes discipleship as well. I want you to see the big picture. I want you to see the goal of why you do soul winning so that you can be able to disciple. Do you know for sure that you're on your way to heaven? My message tonight has been primarily to Christians, to people who know for sure that they have an eternal home in heaven. And maybe there would be somebody here tonight and you say, you know what, I'm just not sure. I do not know. I just don't know that if I were to die tonight that I'd spend an eternity with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. I I don't know where I would go. Can I tell you that there would, uh, if that's you tonight, I would love to be able to maybe myself or if you're a lady and would feel more comfortable talking to a lady to be able to find somebody that would just be willing to sit and show you from the Bible what the Bible says about how you can know for sure that you have your sins forgiven and you have an eternal home in heaven. If that's you tonight with nobody looking around except for myself and pastor behind me, would you just slip your hand up nice and high in the air and say, you know what, my preacher, I, I'm, that's me. I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I would spend uh, an eternity in heaven, or if I'd spend an eternity in hell, and I want somebody to take a Bible and show me how I can know that tonight. Anybody hear it all like that? Anybody hear it all? Father, I want to thank you so much for the time we've had together to look at your word, and I want to thank you for this week of meetings and for the work that you're doing. And uh, Lord, we just thank you. We love you. Thank you for 
giving us the scriptures, Lord, so that we can know how it is that we are to do ministry. And in Jesus' name I pray.